All right, as more people are joining, that's okay, but uh, let's get started. Um, my name is Jesse Ehrlich. I'm the program manager at McGill for the MedTech Talent Accelerator. Um, we're very pleased to be partnering with the Pharmaceutical Career Student Network at McGill to have a presentation today by Dr. Katia Batido, president of ATGen Canada. Uh, Dr. Batido will give an overview of her academic and professional career, uh, transitioning from academia to industry, and she will also compare and contrast the uh, drug development process and medical device development process as well. Um, so first, a quick note about the MedTech Talent Accelerator. Uh, this is an NSERC Create training program, collaboration between McGill and Ryerson University. Um, we are focused on helping grow the Canadian medical technology sector with talent from universities. Um, what we do is provide industry training for graduate students towards the end of their degrees, and then we help place them in internships in the medtech industry. These internships are uh, full-time, four months for master's students, eight months for PhDs, um, and uh, we help with funding and onboarding process and, and make it a smooth process for students and companies and like. So we're very happy to partner with the PCSN on this, uh, on this seminar and in general. And so I will uh, hand it off to my colleagues there to uh, give an introduction of PCSN at McGill. Hi everyone, we are excited to welcome you all to today's innovation seminar, which is a special collaboration between the MedTech Talent Accelerator and our student run initiative called the McGill Pharmaceutical Career Student Network or McGill PCSN. My name is Amanda Fiore. I am the current chair of McGill PCSN and I'm a PhD student in human genetics at McGill University, uh, where I'm currently researching lung cancer. To give you a bit of background on our club, um, McGill PCSN aims to provide students and postdoctoral fellows at McGill with insight on opportunities and career paths outside of academia, academia through a variety of informative and networking style events. We strive to create an environment on campus where industry mentors and like-minded students can interact, or at least virtually for now, to allow you to get one step closer to consolidating your vision of your dream career path. Becoming a member of our club is free and you can join at any time on our website, pcsn-mcgill.com. Um, Jesse, if you can just hit the next animation. Thanks. Uh, so we would also just like to acknowledge the other McGill PCSN exec team members who played a very important role in bringing this seminar to fruition. Uh, there's Morgan Forret, the vice chair, Patricio Artusa, the treasurer, Amanda La Rosa, secretary, Yuki Sato, the graduate student representative, and Laura Yudo, our undergraduate student representative. So I will now turn your attention to our Vice Chair Morgan. Thank you so much, Amanda. Uh, Jesse, if you can switch to the next slide. That'd be great. Thank you. So we're very happy to have all of you here today. And as Amanda mentioned, my name is Morgan Forret, and I act as the Vice Chair of McGill PCSN. I'm originally from Calgary where I earned my BSc in cell biology, but now I'm in my final year of my PhD in pharmacology at McGill studying Alzheimer's disease. As mentioned, this is the first collaborative seminar between MedTech and PCSN, and we're very honored to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Katia Vitito, who has led an exciting and dynamic career in industry with over 20 years of experience in scientific affairs, including regulatory affairs, clinical research, and drug development. Dr. Vitito uh, earned her BSc in physiology and then PhD in pharmacology and therapeutics from McGill University in 1993. Before she graduated, she started working at Savix Incorporated as manager of regulatory affairs, then director of regulatory affairs. Uh, she then joined Paladin Labs as executive director of scientific affairs, where she was responsible for regulatory affairs, clinical trials, quality control, among other uh, roles. In 2003, Dr. Batito launched uh, Reg Farm Consulting that provided strategic guidance to pharmaceutical, medical device, natural health product, and cos cosmetic companies by assisting with regulatory submissions, provincial reimbursement submissions, and medical writing. 
She also helped launch uh, the Canadian subsidiary of the immunodiagnostics company at Gen in 2013, first acting as director, then VP of scientific affairs. And in 2018, she took over the role of president. She also serves on the symposium committee for the Canadian Association of Professional Regulatory Affairs and is a mentor for college and university level students. She has also lectured at McGill University in the departments of pharmacology, parasitology, and family medicine. So we are very excited to welcome her today uh, for her talk entitled Drug and Medical Device Development from Patient Bench to Patient Access. So without further ado, I know we should get started. And thank you so much, Katya, for coming today. We so look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jesse, Amanda, and Morgan. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, okay, so let me just first, a little bit of COVID humor. If, if there are any old Star Trek fans here, you'll really understand what this means. Okay, so I think, you know what, I don't have to go through this too, too much because Morgan talked about it. I went to Marianopolis College and got my deck in health sciences and then uh, went to a McGill and did a bachelor's in physiology. I then decided to do a PhD in pharmacology. Um, and then uh, after that, um, uh, went into the pharmaceutical industry. And my current job is president of ATGen Canada. We're actually transitioning our name to NKMAX Canada to match our global, uh, our gro our, uh, global company name. Okay, so let me give you a little bit of background and how I got here. You guys, most of you guys are way too young to know who these two fellows down here are. But when I was a kid, these were my heroes. The, the guy on the left is Marcus Welby, MD. And the guy on the right, uh, my God, what's his name? That? Oh, Quincy, the medical examiner. So I used to watch these TV shows and say, oh gosh, I want to be a doctor one day, or maybe even a medical examiner. That's so cool. I was such a science nerd when I was little um, that just anything scientific just really, really excited me. And that's where I was going. Uh, ever since I was maybe seven or eight years old, I was going to be a doctor. Okay, so, but you know that I'm not. So why did I become not a real doctor and just a PhD? Well, I'll tell you the choices I made and why. But really, it all comes down to work life balance. I decided as I was you know, growing older, uh, met a significant other. I always knew I wanted to have kids. And so I decided that becoming a real doctor, an MD, didn't really fit with how I wanted to raise kids. I'm a type A personality. I do everything 120%. And I knew that if I was going to be a physician at 120%, I couldn't be a mom at 120%. But I really did want to work. So I had to make a really, really tough choice. So after my BSc, was I going to go to med school? I actually submitted and got accepted into pharmacy school at University of Montreal, or I could have continued um, to grad school, to PhD, and as you know, that's what I ended up. So why didn't I go to pharmacy school? I was actually accepted. I was, remember I'm a total science nerd at this point. I was really, really afraid of the business part of pharmacy. Pharmacy isn't just standing behind the counter and dispensing pills. You have to actually run a pharmacy, at least here in Quebec. The pharmacies are owned by the pharmacists. So you have to understand business. You have to you know, hire people. You have to stock your shelves. And that was business. And that was yucky. Like in my, my books, no, I just want a straight science. So I said, OK, let me go to grad school. Let's see what this is all about. I could have also decided on optometry dentistry, um, physical therapy, or occupational therapy. None of these things really interested me as I researched them. And nursing or veterinary school. Veterinary school here in Quebec, you have to go to, um, to a school out in St. Hyacinth. That wasn't really, I didn't love, you know, that wasn't really something that interested me so, so much. So I chose to do a PhD in pharmacology. Um, first, I got a summer job in a lab, and I learned how to do some pretty gross stuff. Uh, I 
And whenever I would come home and, and people would say, what are you doing? What's your research about? And I would tell them I would do certain things to rats. They were like, ew, how could you do that? Well, I would say, it's so interesting. It's fascinating. Again, that, you know, it really, I loved what I, what I, what I was doing. And throughout my PhD, I also loved the research. I learned a lot of stuff in PhD. Um, well, in, in, at McGill, actually, uh, you start off in a master's, at least in pharmacology. And at the time, we did one year of master's. Then you do a presentation and then decide whether you're able to skip your master's and go directly into a PhD. And that's what I ended up doing. So I never actually got my master's degree. I went straight into a PhD and continued on. Um, so after that PhD, or at, kind of at the end, as I was writing, I said, okay, so what am I going to do with my life? Again, I knew I didn't want to go to medical school. I was now a doctor, just not, not a real doctor. But do I do a postdoc? But at the time, I saw young investigators who were women who uh, were going off to have kids. They would go home. They'd have their kid. They would actually lose their grants because when you're doing research in university setting and academics you need to have grants to fund both your lab and your students so I saw that these uh, these young women would go off would would come back they they wouldn't have as many students and because of that wouldn't publish as much then they if you don't publish as much you don't get the kind of the high level grants and it was kind of a a difficult I thought a difficult situation and something I didn't really want to uh, want to do with my life. And really you have to do not just one postdoc. At the time it was you had to do one postdoc somewhere outside of your uh, outside of, of, of the university that you were in, ideally outside your country. Then you also had to do a second postdoc before you could even apply to be a professor somewhere. So that was a, a long and, and you know, a career path that really didn't interest me too, too much. So then I thought, okay, what else can I do? I can go into clinical research. I knew somebody who was in, you know, at a hospital doing some clinical research, or I could go into the pharmaceutical industry. But back then, this we're talking here 28 years ago, we did not have the PCSN. I wish we had that because I had no idea. The big black box. We didn't know what the pharmaceutical industry was and what kind of jobs there were. So what did I do? I don't know if you guys know what this is. This this blue thing is a telephone. Okay, it doesn't look like an iPhone. It's an actual telephone. This yellow thing is called a phone book. So what I did was I took the phone book and I made a list of all the pharmaceutical companies that were here in Montreal. And I basically I called them up. But before I did that, I said, okay, do I know anybody who's in the pharmaceutical industry right now? doesn't matter what position they're in. Do I know anybody? So I had a friend of mine who had done a PhD and she was already in a pharmaceutical company in regulatory affairs. I called her and I said, okay, so what do you do all day long? Like, what's your job about? I called somebody else who was in clinical research. I called a friend of my dad's from the old country who was actually in marketing in a pharmaceutical com company. And I said, well, what do you do in marketing? I don't even know what marketing means, right? Remember, science nerd who's just done a PhD, what's marketing? I have no idea. So I actually did some research to try to understand what all the different positions within a pharmaceutical company are, and I decided on something called regulatory affairs. So I used my contacts, I used my peers, and I did my homework. So you know now that what I chose was... Um, so let me just go back up for one second here. How did I get, how did I end up getting that first job? So remember I told you I called all those companies? Well, I was pretty persistent. I would pick up the phone. Once, once I had decided I wanted regulatory affairs, I picked up the phone and I called the company and I said, could I please speak to your head of regulatory affairs? And some of them were like, are you kidding me? No, what do you want? And I said, well, I'm looking for, and I would explain, I have a PhD and I want a job. Okay, here's HR. So they would send me to HR. Or they would say, you know, go away, just send me your CV. But every once in a while, I would actually get in contact with the head of regulatory affairs. And one of these contacts, he was a small company, said, I don't really have anything. You know, good luck. Great. He calls me back the next day and he says, you know what? I got 
just after you got off the phone with you, I got a phone call from a headhunter looking for uh, somebody to do a regulatory affairs job in this small company. He names me the company and I look, wasn't on my list. I guess they weren't in the phone book. I don't know. So I said, okay, great. So the headhunter calls me. I go meet with them. I meet with the company and they're like, uh, you don't even have your PhD yet. Remember Morgan said I started before my PhD. I was writing my PhD, but I was looking for jobs because I knew that when I finished, when I submitted, that's it. The grants go and I have no more money. So I meet with them and they're like, mm, I don't know, you have no experience. But somehow I convinced them that I was a go-getter and that I was able to actually tackle the position and they hired me. And what did I do? I just, I figured it out. I picked up the phone. If I didn't know what I was doing, I picked up the phone. I called uh, Health Canada because I was in regulatory affairs and the people that I deal with are Health Canada. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this later. And then I figured out my job um, on the go. I stayed there for seven years and actually had two kids while I was there. So this was a small generic company. It was called Sabex. Today it's called Sandoz. I started as manager of regulatory affairs, became director. I hired staff. I built, I built a whole uh, department. And then after my second uh, kid, I decided I want to work part time. So I went to a company called Paladin Labs. Uh, which uh, I, I was their executive director of scientific affairs. And I basically worked four days a week, which was really uh, useful given that I had two little kids. And then uh, when my daughter was four, I decided to become a consultant. So I would, uh, so I left, I worked from home. And actually during that time, I also taught science in elementary school, which was really fun for a couple of years. So as you know, uh, I, uh, I did this uh, and I, I still do this. So this is uh, about 17, 18 years now. I was hired as one of my clients uh, to be their scientific affairs person. And two years ago, took over the company as president. Okay, so what do I actually do? What's my job? So my job, part of it is called regulatory affairs. So what is that? It's the liaison between the company. So the pharmaceutical and medical device company and Health Canada. Health Canada are the ones who look at your information and decide whether or not you can launch your product on the Canadian market. So I prepare scientific documents, I review them, I write them, and I summarize basically all the studies in animals and humans on what the product is, on how it's made and how it's tested. And I'm gonna go into this in, in considerable detail a little bit later on. Um, I write those package inserts, you know, those boxes you get and you get those, those those inserts with all that tiny, tiny writing. Well, that's written by somebody in regulatory affairs. And then I submit all the information, all the scientific information I submitted to Health Canada and negotiate with them to get the product approved. What else do I do in medical affairs? I do clinical studies in collaboration with doctors that are based in hospitals. Currently, I'm doing studies in cancer research. I meet with what we call key opinion leaders. These are doctors who are the head of their, um, their uh, respective um, um, word? Um, disciplines, basically, to discuss possibilities for research. I prepare clinical tr research trial protocols. I prepare the reports. I do statistical analyses. I create educational modules for physicians for new devices or new therapies. So it will be PowerPoint presentations to explain what the product is, how it's used, um, based on how Health Canada approved the use for these products. And I also help with creating marketing materials. So with the marketing, sales and marketing uh, departments, create materials for both patients and physicians to help them understand the product and how to use it properly. Quality control is another part of, of my job. I make sure that the company systems are in place to guarantee the quality of the finished product, to make sure it's made properly, to make sure it's tested properly, to make sure that what you get at the end is something that is uh, what Health Canada said should be the product, the end product, and that it's safe to use. This is the quality management system for medical devices called ISO 13485. 
for drugs or natural health products is called GMP or Good Manufacturing Practices. Other parts of my job, I meet with Health Canada in Ottawa. I negotiate with both scientists and doctors about our data. So the negotiations could be with Health Canada and could be with doctors about new studies or about the current data. And sometimes they will challenge you and say, well, I don't really understand why you're saying this. And you have to understand your data and you have to be able to talk scientist to scientist. And then I also interact with a lot of people in, the, in pharmaceutical companies that are in different divisions within a company, marketing, sales, quality control, research and development, manufacturing or clinical research. I'm in a small company, so I happen to be doing all of this stuff. But when you're in a larger company, uh, your role is a little bit more constrained and you will, you will deal with all kinds of different people within the larger company that are, are in these different departments. Okay, um, strategic discussions. Interesting, especially as a consultant and being that the companies that I've been with have been very, very entrepreneurial. They've been family run companies. They've, you've had to sort of wear more than one hat. When you're in a big pharma company, your role is, like I said, a little bit more discreet. In a, in a, big, in a, in a small entrepreneurial company, it, you have to understand the business or you get to understand the business. So even though in the way back when I was, when I was after my bachelor's, I said business, I, had, I didn't want anything to do with it. Well, guess what? I learned business as I went along my career uh, path. So being in the entrepreneurial env environment allowed me to understand that decisions that are made at our level, the scientific level, have impact across the board in, in different parts of the company, whether it be marketing, or clinical, quality, or uh, reimbursement or patient information, all kinds of, of different impact. We can have all kinds of different impact. So what's important is to understand that decisions that you make have that impact. So, the, so, so understanding the strategy around a product launch or a product development is very, very useful. And that's a lot of the, the, the things that I have learned over time is somebody might ask you a question, but and you may have the answer, but really sometimes you have to dig a little bit deeper and ask them question back, questions back so that you open up the discussions to bring in a lot of other things that might have an impact on the question that they're actually asking you. I don't know if that makes any sense, um, but what I'm basically trying to say is if somebody asks you, like for example, let me give you an example. If somebody asks me, to get them a product registration for a particular product. But they don't know that that product registration, they won't be able to sell it in Canada unless they find somebody to help them import the product into Canada, then they'll never be able to sell it. So I have to ask them, do you have an importer? And they say, well, why do I need one? And I'll explain to them, you need one because of the following. So that helps them think a little bit outside of the regulatory box to understand that there's other things they have that they have to understand for their business uh, rather than just you know the, the scientific question. I'm also a regulatory expert for lawsuits. So I will be called upon by lawyers to give a, an expert opinion on a particular regulation that Health Canada had at a particular point in time. Uh, I do what's called due diligence. I'll, I'll go to a company and review all of their scientific information in case somebody wants to buy a product or a company, and I might give an opinion. <coughs> and then I'm also on some task forces with Health Canada and the industry, where we're looking at changing certain regulations in Canada, and they ask for the opinion of industry. And we have discussions and negotiations about why, how industry feels about what Health Canada wants to do. And then currently, I also do a lot of administration, sales, marketing, budgeting as part of my current job. So what else can you do with a background? So let's say you have a Bachelor of Science, a PhD, or an engineering degree. What else can you do other than what I just explained what I do? Well, you could be a professor. You could teach. You need a PhD, at least at McGill. 
you, you work individually with your grad students on your research program, you're self-sufficient, you have to write grants, and you have to get grants every few years. So there are pluses and minuses, obviously, of, of staying in academia. And you can have academic rewards. You can also teach at the college level. So in Quebec, it's called CJAP, but it's basically grades uh, 12 and 13 at elementary or high school. And you might need an education degree for that. When I taught in elementary school, we didn't. Uh, you could be a pharmaceutical sales rep. So what does that mean? Well, you're working on the road. You use your science knowledge to go visit physicians. Under COVID times, obviously, it's a little bit different. So I haven't adapted this to the COVID situation. But you see doctors in their offices. You visit pharmacists in communities and hospitals to teach them about the new drug that you have uh, to sell. You could be what's called a medical science liaison in the pharmaceutical industry. So that's basically the link between the company and the key opinion leaders. Those are the doctors, the high profile doctors in their field to look at uh, um, either providing education or new clinical trials within uh, that the company is working on on products that might be in their pipeline. So you're finding the doctors who want to do those studies for the products that are in the pipeline that the, that the companies are developing. You need a PhD. Rarely uh, masters are accepted, but whenever you look for jobs for MSLs, it always calls for PhDs and sometimes MDs. It's home-based and there is a lot of travel. Here, if you, if you want to read a really good interview on what it means to be an MSL, I provided a link here for you. Okay, in the med tech industry, you can become what's called a technical science liaison. So it's the same thing as an MSL, but in this case, it's the, the, the person who understands the technology of your product, the link between the company and the researchers or the companies or the end user who's going to use your technology. So let's say you have a new MRI machine, you and the company know how, how it works, but the techs in the, in the uh, hospital don't, it's brand new, it's got some new functionality, you're the one who has to go to that uh, hospital to teach them how to use it, to troubleshoot, and to make sure that they use it within uh, the parameters that you have, uh, you have decided. You also provide education, workshops, presentations, demonstrations on your new technology. You need a, at least a bachelor's or a bachelor of engineering. You need to understand your technology. So MSLs and TSLs. So what do I mean here? Practice working the room. The people who go into these types of positions really have to have a personality that is able to cold call people. But what I mean by that is you're able to go to a physician that you've never met before and you have to say within a very short amount of time, you have to almost pitch your product. It's like a sales rep in a sense, but what you're pitching here is an idea, a scientific idea to get them interested in your science, to get them to open up a discussion about either uh, a clinical trial you want to do or your new technology. So when I say practice working the room, if you want to have a job in the, either of these, um, in these kinds of jobs, you should practice doing this in a social situation, obviously outside of COVID. Um, it's, it's a really good um, exercise to basically go to a party. And if you don't know anybody, go up to a stranger and give them like a two minute pitch on who you are and, and what you like and then ask them questions and get them to do the same. So it's getting yourself out of your comfort zone zone of just being in the lab or just writing your uh, articles. You really have to learn how to practice selling the science. And actually what I learned in my PhD at McGill is how to do that with all the presentations that I had to do. They, the first presentation I ever did, I was horrible. It was, I was, I was, stilted. I was, you know, I didn't know how to do a presentation. But as I developed my ability to sell my science and to sell my ideas, that that skill set that you're getting during your PhD and even your master's really, really helps you in the job world.
And again, practicing negotiations. So if you have the chance to take a business course somehow, or even in a social situation, practice doing some negotiations. Let's say uh, you have to you know, renew your contract for your cell phone and the cost is like way too high and you're like, uh, and they increase it $5 and you're, I'm not paying that. Well, you know what? You try to negotiate something and you use those skills to try to uh, change your situation. And practicing in the social situations helps you do the negotiating when you have to be in front of, let's say, a whole bunch of people from Health Canada, and you have to convince them that your drug or your technology really is the best thing. Okay, what else can you do? You could work at Health Canada. Actually, a, a couple of friends of mine who are from pharmacology actually work there already. And you, you can apply and you could work either by reviewing applications for pharmaceuticals or for medical devices, clinical trials, drugs, and technologies. You can do uh, R&D work. You can do preclinical research. Actually, in Quebec, we've got some, uh, some companies who do a lot of preclinical research. You can work in a clinical research environment. We have some clinical research organizations here. Uh, there's a lot in Montreal and Toronto that uh, do clinical research. You can go into quality control, into marketing, into business development, and don't be afraid of business like I was. It's, um, it actually, in every single one of these jobs, the business does creep in. Find a good mentor or a role model. Obtain your good science skills. If you get a chance to take some business courses, that would be great. Um, but you know what, if you have had summer jobs in business or in research, even if it's uh, a summer job, for example, in a store, you've practiced that, that negotiating, you've practiced being able to sell something to someone that those skills actually do translate very, very well to the corporate world. And management in any industry is an asset. Okay, so let's switch gears. Um, just looking at the time, we're good. So what's involved in drug and medical device development? I'm gonna start with a little bit of history. Sir William Osler was uh, graduated from McGill in 1872 with a medical degree. He was a professor in the Faculty of Medicine. He's the founder of uh, the Journal Club. So I know that in uh, your PhD studies, <clears throat> we used to do journal club, so if you hate it, you can blame him. But actually, that journal club, I have a funny story there. The very, in very in first year uh, PhD or master's, a very first journal club, uh, I assisted. Somebody was presenting, an older student, and they presented this paper, how they were able to, um, you know, critically assess what the article was. And I'm like sitting there with my eyes wide and so how did she, I had read the paper and I did not understand the same thing at all. I actually probably didn't even understand the paper. And she ate, was able to critically assess the article. And I'm like, wow, Journal Club actually is something that is an amazing thing because you really, really learn how to critically read articles, scientific articles, understand whether they were well done and understand whether the conclusions actually um, meet with the data that they're presenting. So Journal Club is, is a great thing. So thank you, Dr. Osler. He also founded the idea of McGill residency, of medical residency, sorry, for med students. And he founded the John Hopkins Medical School. And if you look at the background where I am, that's actually the Osler Library at McGill. It's a fake Zoom background, I'm not actually there. So what did Dr. Osler say? Man has an inborn craving for medicine. Heroic dosing for several generations has given its tissues a thirst for drugs. The desire to take medicines is one feature which distinguishes man, the animal, from his fellow creatures. What is a drug? Well, Health Canada, or the, there's a Food and Drugs Act in Canada, which says that a drug is a substance or a mixture of substances which are used in the diagnosis, treatment, mitigation, or prevention of a disease, a disorder, abnormal physical state, or its symptoms, 
in human beings or in animals. A drug is used to restore, correct, or modify organic functions in human beings or animals. Or a drug is also a disinfectant for premises where food is manufactured or kept. All right. Okay, in uh, Canada, what kinds of products are regulated as drugs? You can have a prescription drug. You can have a non-prescription drug, so that's what we call over-the-counter or OTC. You can have a generic drug. A generic drug, so you have brand name drugs. So the brand name drug is the very first drug that's on the market of a particular molecule. Once the patent runs out, you can have something called a generic drug. The generic drug is a copy of the brand name drug. And, uh, you know, if you get them from, from the pharmacy, you'll see the name of the drug on your pill bottle is actually the molecule name rather than the brand name. You can have biological drugs, which would be vaccines, uh, blood products, uh, proteins, radiopharmaceuticals, natural health products. And within the natural health products, you have homeopathic products, traditional herbal medicines, and other herbals and you have disinfectants. Also veterinary drugs fall under the Food and Drugs Act. So how do you actually develop a drug? The first first step, either in drug or medical device, is always to def define what is there an unmet medical need. Is there a disease or a condition where there is no treatment that is available or or there is a treatment but it's not the optimal treatment maybe that treatment has a lot of side effects and you need ideally to find something that will help um, meet this unmet medical need you also have to understand if you're targeting a particular disease you have to understand the molecular mechanism of a disease so this is where your pharmacologists come in uh, so they they understand you know, how uh, the receptors work, for example, in a particular um, disorder, and then how to target that particular receptor. So you have to understand from a basic biochemical point of view how that disease or the disorder that causes that disease, how does that really work? And then you have to identify a therapeutic target within that pathway. So is it a gene that you have to play with? Is it an enzyme that you have to block? Is it a receptor that you have to activate or inactivate? All of that is uh, something that you look at when you're trying to develop a, a molecule for a particular unmet medical need. So the first step is discovery of lead compounds. Lead compounds are that discovery. So those are the chemists within a, a, a company that will take a look at compounds, either by looking at compound libraries, structure activity relationships, natural uh, compounds, uh, things that are available in, in, in the natural world, to, and to try to understand the structure of those compounds. Once that's been discovered and understood, they have to look at what, how that compound behaves in animals and they look at is it safe in animals and does it do what they think it does once they do that they evaluate whether it's safe and effective in humans and then they make a dosage form this is just an overview of the drug development process i'm going to go into this a little bit um, more detail but before i do that i want to talk a little bit about history again um, Sometimes drugs are actually discovered by serendipity. It, the drug penicillin, an old drug, was actually discovered by chance by somebody doing an experiment with some bacteria in a petri dish and saw some mold that was growing in it. And they saw that under the mold, the bacteria was all killed. And they were like, that's kind of weird. They isolated what was in the mold and tested it on other bacteria and discovered that that mold was producing a compound which they isolated, it was called penicillin and was able to kill bacteria. So that's pretty cool. Rogaine. Rogaine is a, a product that's actually used as a topical to help grow hair. 
but how was it developed? It was actually a, uh, the molecule was being used for severe hypertension. And there was this, this woman, which was taking really, really high doses. And she came to her doctor after a couple of weeks. And she says, I have hair all over my body. Like, that's really weird. So the doctor uh, looked at her and said, oh, that is a little bit strange side effect. And actually, uh, two doctors ended up saying, hmm, that, that's actually very interesting. interesting. So they, on the side, without telling anybody, created a little bit of a cream. They were both sort of bald. They created a little bit of a cream and, and started you know, applying it uh, to themselves without telling the FDA or anybody and found that it actually grew hair on their head. And that's and then they actually did the, the, the real studies to, to to develop it as a topical. And Viagra, we all know what Viagra is. How did it come about? It was being used for a cardiovascular reason. And it wasn't actually a great drug for angina, but it was an interesting side effect that it uh, gave the men erections. And they were like, okay, it's not really working for their heart, but it's Quite interesting. They took that side effect and decided to test it for what it's being used for today. And then here's a really interesting article on other drugs developed by serendipity. There's a little bit of a link. Yeah, there's a link down there. Okay, you've got your lead, lead compound, but you have to understand, does that molecule do what you think it does? So you need to do proof of concept for that molecule. You have to show whether it works in an animal disease model. Before you've done that, actually, you've looked in vitro, you might have looked, you know, uh, you know, your classical pharmacology water bath, let's say you have an, a piece of a tissue, and you your drug, you think it, it you know, it constricts muscles, well, you're going to put a muscle on a water bath, you're going to bathe it with the, the, the molecule, and you can say, okay, does it do what I think it does. So that's some classical um, early studies to look at does that compound do what I think it does. Once you uh, show that it does, you have to go into an animal model and prove that it actually does once it's in an animal model. You have to make sure that you optimize the compound to give it a drug-like property. What do I mean by that? You have to make sure that the product doesn't get degraded very, very rapidly. So in other words, if it's a molecule that you expose it to air and it gets degraded immediately, well, that's not gonna be a product that's gonna be easy to make into a drug. So you have to make sure that's able to be um, metabolized, that there's not too many side effects when it's given in, a, in an animal, that, um, that it's able to be absorbed, distributed, metabolized and excreted properly. So it has to behave like a drug. So these are the very, very early studies that um, the chemists and biochemists are doing when you're looking at a new molecule. Once you've done all of this and you think that it works the way you think it does, you've got what's called a preclinical candidate. Preclinical means before humans. It's a candidate to do research in animals. So another quote, when you're looking at a preclinical candidate, what's important is you have to figure out what dose you want to use in a human. But the only way you can figure that out is to do a whole lot of work in animals because the work that you do in animals will predict the risk to humans. And that's called the non-clinical pharmacology and toxicology development. So that program, the preclinical program, looks at, does it work? What does the drug do to the body? So when, when you block that receptor, what happens in the body when you block that receptor? Does it do what you think it does? You're using here, you're using you know, those water baths, you're using cell culture, you're, you're using a bunch of in vitro models uh, and trying to minimize in vivo models on so minimizing rats and mice that you might want to use to try to show that it does what you think it does. So the efficacy of that molecule. But you also need to understand what does the body do to the drug? So whenever people ask me, oh, you have a PhD in pharmacology, so you're a pharmacist, right? And I'm like, no, a pharmacist knows what drugs to give for 
different diseases. Me as a pharmacologist, I know what happens to the body when you take the drug. So I can tell you if I take this molecule, your body will do this. And if if uh, I take this molecule, I will I will uh, do this to this particular pathway. That's what a pharmacologist knows. They understand what the body does to the drug. And you have to understand the pharmacokinetics, so the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. But what's also important at this stage two is how can you deliver that drug? You have to understand. Remember I said if the drug isn't, isn't stable and you take it uh, and you want to give it orally, but the minute you put it under an acidic environment in the stomach, it gets degraded, well, that drug is never going to work in the body. So you then have to think, okay, so maybe I have to give it intravenously because that's the only way that that molecule works. So you have to, the chemists have to understand the molecule to understand how it's delivered. Maybe it can only be delivered through the skin or through uh, the muscle, for example. So you're also looking at whether it's safe. So you're looking at toxicity, genetic toxicity, carcinogenicity, reproductive toxicities, and a whole bunch of other special uh, investigations. And that's really, really important. So your preclinical program is actually pretty critical to try to understand or predict the risk in a patient. And why is that so important? Well, in the early 60s, thalidomide, so I don't know if any of you know this story, but there was a product that was on the market for women who had nausea. This uh, was called thalidomide. It was uh, developed and put on the market in Europe. It was put on the market in Canada, but not in the US. There was actually a, a woman from, from Canada who uh, was part of the FDA who looked at the data and, and wasn't comfortable with the preclinical package that was presented and said, no, I wanna see some more data. But Health Canada did put it on the market. And what ha ended up happening is it caused limb buds in children of women taking the drugs. So limb buds are where your, your, your limbs actually is, is, is cut off here. The development of the limbs was not proper when the women took this during pregnancy. So the company did not do enough studies in more than one species. And actually, they should have done studies in rabbits, which would have shown this issue. When they went back and did the studies, they saw that the signal was there in rabbits but it wasn't there in mice and rats. And if had they done a proper preclinical program, they would not have ever put this product on the market. It was actually withdrawn in 1962. The issue is, is that this molecule, thalidomide, is actually a really good molecule. And 10 years ago, it was approved in Canada for multiple myeloma, obviously with certain restrictions, but it's actually a really, really good molecule. But what the thalidomide story ended up doing was uh, the, both the FDA and Health Canada formalized their approval process for drugs in the early 60s because of thalidomide, where they were uh, asking companies, requesting a specific program of preclinical data in order to properly predict risk in humans. Okay, so in summary, the objective of the non-clinical program is really to predict risk to humans. What is the safe and effective dose that produces the least amount of side effects? I put this picture up for the pharmacologists. Um, okay, so what's that margin of safety relative to the intended clinical dose? And the biological importance of these observations What's important is to have different species because you can see different things in different species. In order to predict uh, risk in humans, you have to make sure you've done the right species based on your molecule. And Health Canada will take a look at all of this information before they even allow you to, to, to give that first dose to a human. This is just a little bit of um, uh, to try to. To, to, to give you an idea of basically why drugs cost so much. People are always saying, oh, the pharmaceutical companies are charging so much money for their drugs. Well, 
remember I talked about those lead compounds, those chemists working, trying to find those compounds. They screen about five to 10,000 compounds before they choose about 250 of them to go into the preclinical phase. The preclinical phase is where you do all that animal toxicology work. Well, that work costs about $1.1 billion to get to the stage where you've got your preclinical compounds going into clinical research. So it's about two and a half percent of those initial compounds will actually go into the preclinical stage. So it's very, very little. It's a lot of work to get to that, those potential uh, compounds that might uh, end up being a drug. Okay, so I've talked about the animal work, the prediction of risk to humans. So once we have those candidates, the, the next step to do is really to go into humans. So you go into what's called clinical research. Clinical just means humans, uh, research in humans. So clinical research is uh, giving a, that drug candidate and administering it to humans. The goal of the studies is to show efficacy and safety of the molecule before obtaining authorization from Health Canada to put that product on the market. There are different phases of clinical research. The first phase, which is called phase one, is, is in healthy volunteers. Now we're talking about your average molecule. If we're looking at cancer molecules, you're not gonna give a cancer drug to a healthy volunteer. So phase one studies are actually very different. If you're looking at a molecule for diabetics, you're not gonna give it to a healthy volunteer. You're, you're, um, you're not gonna put patients or volunteers at risk. So the only ones you will give to a healthy volunteer are those that Health Canada says it's okay to, to give to them. But the idea of doing those studies, those phase one studies, is to take a look at the dose that you might wanna use in a patient. And how do you know that dose? So you've done all of that work in those animals and you've looked at a milligram per kilogram based on the animal. You translate that to human. The average human is about 70 kilograms. You translate that dose to a human amount. And then you say, well, I'm not really sure that that's the dose. So you give a few doses you know, before, a few doses after, and you try to, to minimize the risk and the side effects that you might create with those doses. So the goal of phase one is really a safety, to look at the safety of that molecule at different doses. And also to look at the pharmacokinetics. Well, how, how is it absorbed, distributed, excreted? Where does it go in the body? Those are some of the basic things that you're looking at in phase one. You might even see some preliminary efficacy in phase one, depending on the molecule and depending on what the outcome is that you're looking at. Phase two is the first time you go into the disease model or the patient. You're looking at safety, you're looking at efficacy, but you're also looking at dose response. Again, dose response is to find that dose, the optimal dose that gives you the efficacy you want with the least amount of side effects in the patient. Phase three, those are much, much larger trials. They're longer term trials. So you're looking at long-term safety, you're confirming your efficacy, and usually you compare your drug to either a placebo or to a standard of care. In certain instances, you can't compare to a placebo. Again, let's, let's uh, look at a cancer drug, you're not going to give a cancer drug versus a placebo. You're going to get a, a cancer drug versus the standard cancer therapy for that uh, tumor. How many patients and how long do these studies take? In phase one, you do about 20, 20 to 100 healthy volunteers. It takes about six to 12 months. And again, you're looking at safety. 70% of the drug candidates succeed through phase one. 30% have their side effects are too, um, too much for you to proceed to the next level. Health Canada won't allow you to put the risk of patients uh, in jeopardy with something that has too many side effects. Moving into phase two, you go into patients with about 100 to 1,000 patients. It takes about two years. And there you're looking at safety and efficacy. And only about a third of the ones that have moved into phase two actually make it through that program. 
So you take those, you bring them into the phase three program, and you do at least two studies long term, about a thousand to ten thousand patients. That takes you know one to four years, but it's more like four years, and only a third of those end up being um, successful through the phase three program. Let's go back to this. Well, how much does it cost and how many compounds actually make it through? Well, remember there were five to 10,000 compounds in the beginning, 250 made it through the preclinical, so two and a half percent. Only five of those 250, or five of those 10,000, sorry, make it through the, to phase two or through phase two and only one end up getting approved. So of those 10,000 initial lead compounds, yeah, 0.01% actually make it through to drug approval and to the market. And the cost from the beginning to the end is about two and a half billion dollars in, I think it's 2017 dollars. Okay. Efficacy versus effectiveness. So I'm going to try and go a little bit quicker. So these are two terms as a pharmacologist. It irks me when I read a paper and they talk about uh, a new molecule and the effectiveness when really what they're described is an, is an efficacy trial. An efficacy trial is something that is uh, conducted under a controlled environment. It's usually a randomized controlled trial where patients uh, are followed very closely and therefore you have very good patient compliance on the drug. Effectiveness is a study that's performed under real world conditions. The population is broader, you have less control, so you're not really sure whether the patients are complying to the, the, the drug um, dosage regimen, but it's actually these studies are really, really important because these generate what we call real world evidence. What's real world evidence? So here in Montreal, we have a, a company called Merck. Merck uh, developed in Montreal a product called Viox. Viox is a COX-2 inhibitor, and it received approval after performing controlled clinical studies in more than 5,400 subjects. So Health Canada approved it, no issues there. After approval, they did a study in 8,000 participants to, to, to look at whether Vioxx was safer than a common NSAID for the digestive system. And they started seeing a safety signal. They saw that there were heart problems uh, in Vioxx versus naproxen. It was a small signal, but a signal nonetheless, so a safety signal. They published the study with a rationale for this signal. They sort of downplayed the signal. If you want to read the article, that's uh, that I put a little um, note down here. Take a look at the, the real history and, and, and what people believe. I'm not going to, I don't know what really happened, so I won't, I won't comment. But they did another study looking at Vioxx on the prevention of colon polyps, because actually the COX-2 pathway is involved in polyp, um, uh, um, I can't find the word, on, on, on the um, creation of polyps in the colon. And again, in that study, they showed an increase in the risk of heart attacks. And what was happening actually out there in the real world is that they were getting signals of adverse events from patients using the product and they were seeing heart attacks. So that led Health Canada to say, wait a minute, there's a signal that's showing up when it's not in a controlled environment, when patients are taking it for all kinds of different things, and that is a signal that is worrisome. They actually ended up withdrawing the product from the market. 15 years later, so it was withdrawn for quite some time, 15 years later, because it's actually a really, really good drug, but it's being considered for a very, very targeted indication by a small company who picked up the product again and is being used for hemophiliac patients. These patients actually cannot take NSAIDs, but they can take something like Vioxx. So what this story tells us is that you can do all the randomized control trials, the phase three trials for approval, but when it goes out in the real world, sometimes you see signals that will cause you to reevaluate the 
benefit risk ratio of, of a particular molecule and then Health Canada needs to step in. Okay, so you've done your preclinical, you've done your clinicals, all your different phases, and now you have to figure out what dosage form am I going to use? I need to optimize, I need to make sure that that dosage form is adapted to the disease. So for example, if I'm targeting the elderly and my molecule is only able to be made into a very, very large pill, well, that's gonna be an issue because the elderly cannot take big pills. They need small little pills that are coated, that are able to slide down easily. So maybe a pill is not the ideal dosage form for that drug. Maybe it's a, a patch, for example. So you have to make sure that you adapt your dosage form to the disease state. I mean, I'm giving, I'm telling this to you now, but it's really important that if you remember, I mentioned it before, it's important that you understand your dosage form before you've done all your clinical trials, because that's how you, you will get approval on your dosage form is based on the clinical trials you've done on the dosage form that you're going to want to market. The dosage form must be easily absorbed and it also must have an adequate shelf life. So your chemists, your R&D people have to make sure that however they formulate that product, that it's stable for at least 12 months and that it's stable in an environment that we normally would keep our drugs. How many of you keep your drugs in the bathroom? That's not the normal environment. So if, if you're gonna take a message away from today, this is one of them. Do not keep your drugs in the bathroom medicine cabinet. Why? Because when you develop a drug, you develop it at room temperature, you do your stability studies at room temperature and at your typical humidity levels. The minute you take that humidity level and you increase it, that starts to degrade your drug and that starts to create potential issues in both efficacy and safety of your drug. So if you keep your drugs in the bathroom, you may be changing the shelf life of your drug. You may actually make your drug a little more dangerous. So take them out right now. Okay, in about half an hour, take them out, put them somewhere else. Here are some common dosage forms. There's patches, there's creams, there's puffers, there's pills. Um, you know, for kids, there's these little, you know, uh, strips that you can put on your tongue that melt, suppositories in Quebec here. We like suppositories, it's very European, not so much in the US, uh, there's injectables. Anyway, so there's all kinds of dosage forms that are available. The last stage is registering the technical file, is putting together all the scientific information to obtain market authorization. In Canada, this is called a new drug submission, and it has all the information that the Minister of Health will need to be able to assess the safety and effectiveness of the new drug. Okay, um, I'm not gonna go through this, but this is basically a list of everything that has to be in the, in the new drug submission. It's basically, what is it? How is it made? Is it safe? Is it effective? You also need to put draft labeling. You also need to provide to Health Canada what's called a brand name lookalike sound alike assessment or, or LASA. What this is is to make sure that the brand name that you choose and I don't know about you, but when I listen to those commercials in the U.S. and they have those brand names, I, I, I always giggle because they're always pretty funny, you know, X's and Z's. And I don't know how they come up with their brand names, these companies. But regardless of your brand name, you actually have to do a study to make sure that it doesn't sound like another brand name so that there might be a medication error so that either the doctor will write the wrong thing or the pharmacist will either read or hear the wrong name and give something completely different to a patient. You also need to understand the patent situation and submit any information on the patents to Health Canada. Patents are important because Health Can you need to register your patents with Health Canada. You, as you develop a drug, you will at one point have submitted a patent and that patent will last 20 years. You have to register that patent with Health Canada because you wanna prevent a copy, a generic product from filing a submission during your patent life. If you don't register your patent on the Health Canada database, a generic product could submit to Health Canada and then you'd have a legal battle on your hands. 
usually you'll have about 12 to 14 years left on your patent when you submit to Health Canada because those patents are usually granted for, for 20 years. The regulator in Canada is Health Canada, oops, sorry, called the Health Products and Foods Branch and different directorates and offices which cover all types of foods, drugs, and medical devices. The approval of the drug is called a notice of compliance. No one can submit for the same molecule until the patent is expired or if there is no patent until six years from the notice of compliance. Health Canada will publish uh, a summary basis of decision for the public, and that explains what, uh, what was used as the basis from the scientific perspective to authorize that drug. And then if it's a prescription drug, there's a list of prescription drugs that Health Canada manages on their website. In Canada, drugs that are patented are regulated, so there's, it's called the Patented Medicine Prices Review Board. They regulate the prices. They tell the company what price they're allowed to charge for their patented drug. So they ensure that prices in Canada are not excessive. And a patented medicine is any drug to which a patent exists, whether it's on the active ingredient, on the manufacturing practice, or on delivery system or use. Interestingly, there have been cases where if there has been a very short amount of time left on a patent, companies have decided to cancel their patents in order to be outside of the purview of the PMPRB so that they could charge whatever they wanted. So the PMPRB couldn't tell them what they could charge. Okay, the PMPRB will regulate the price that the company charges to a wholesaler, a hospital, or a pharmacy, but it doesn't regulate the price that the wholesaler or the pharmacy will charge the patient. So if there's no patent, there's no oversight. Market access, um, you have your drug, it's approved. The PMPRB tells you what you're allowed to charge for it, but it doesn't mean that the provincial governments will pay for it. Sometimes the patient has to pay. The provinces and territories actually have the final word on whether a medication is funded by the public system. In Canada, we have provincial jurisdictions. They are responsible for their primary health budgets. So they make those decisions on what's paid for or not. There is a Canadian-wide agency called the Canadian Agency for Drugs and, Techno and Health Technologies, or Technologies and Health, CADIS, and they have committees called the Common Drug Review or the Pan-Canadian Oncology Drug Review. And in Quebec, they don't use those committees. They use their own committee called the ENES. They will look at those products and make the decision from a health technology perspective, whether they want to cover the drug, whether they want to pay for the drug from a public perspective. Once they decide, okay, yes, I will cover it, they will then negotiate a price with that company. The federal government actually has also some formularies for First Nations, for veterans, for Canadian forces, for correctional services, and they too will decide whether or not to cover those drugs. So up here on the left, Health Canada, the only job that they have is to say, is it safe and does it work? They will give you the, that approval. Once it's approved, it doesn't mean it's covered or paid for by the provincial formulary. So CADIF will look at it and say, okay, how does it compare with existing treatment options? Is it good value? Those committees will give a recommendation to the federal and provincial and ter territorial drug plans and the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance for pricing and say, okay, is it needed? Is it affordable? And that decision for, for payment comes down to those jurisdictions. So if they say no, and you want that drug, you have to pay for it, and then you have to see if your private insurance will cover that drug. Let's switch now to medical devices. I don't have a lot of time, um, but I, by the way, I can stay beyond one o'clock if, uh, if, if, if we need to have a lot of questions. What's a medical device? A medical device is an instrument, an apparatus, other simil similar articles, which is manufactured, sold, or represented for use in the diagnosing, treating, mitigating, prevention, preventing a disease, a disorder, etc. Sounds a lot like a drug, right? 
or restoring, modifying, or correcting the body structure of human beings or animals, or the functioning of a body part, diagnosing pregnancy, caring for human beings during pregnancy, including caring for offspring, or preventing conception. But it does not include an instrument, article, etc., etc., that acts by pharmacological, immunological, or metabolic means, or solely by chemical means, in or on the body of human beings. So what does that mean? A drug acts by pharmacological, immunological, metabolic means. So a medical device is anything else that might change the body or be used for a disease that doesn't act by a pharmacological means, but usually acts by either a mechanical mean or some other uh, mechanical way. There are different classes of medical device. There are, these are based on risk. In, in Canada, we have a, a really nice guidance that allows you to take a look at trying to figure out whether your new technology, your device, is in which class of risk based on Health Canada. It's these classification rules. And some of the questions you sort of have to ask is, is it invasive? Does it go into the body? How, if it does, how long does it stay in the body? Is it active? Does it need energy to work? So those are just some of the questions. There's a whole bunch of other questions that you sort of have to go through to try to figure out what class your product is. And there's the rules and there's actually a keyword index that will help you decide what classification it might be in. And based on the classification, allows you to figure out what evidence you're gonna to need to provide to Health Canada in order to get that approved. I just put here the two links, if you need them, for Health Canada's uh, guidances for those rules and keyword index. Here's some medical devices. I bet you didn't know that a manual toothbrush is a medical device in Canada. It is. Um, you know, here's some other, so class one is on the left. And as you move to the right, it's higher and higher class. So manual toothbrush is a class one, but a toothbrush that is powered so it has some electricity is a class two. Why? Because if that power gives out, there's the risk that you won't brush your teeth. So it's a higher risk than a class one. So it, it always go when you move up a step, it's a question of increasing the risk. If that product doesn't work as it should, does that organic function or whatever it is you're trying to do, is there an impact? on that organic function. So the lowest risk is class one. And actually, you don't even have to ask Health Canada to approve a class one medical device. There is no pre-market approval. All you have to do is uh, you have to make sure as a company that that product is manufactured properly. And if there are any adverse events that happen with that device, you have to advise Health Canada. So that's what it means by post-market, called post-market surveillance. Class two, you do ask for a license, but you don't have to provide any evidence to Health Canada. You have to have that evidence on hand. And you have to have a quality system to make sure that your product is manufactured properly. And then you have control over how it's made. And you have post-market surveillance. For class three and class four devices, so the highest risk, there you do have a pre-market review. You have to submit evidence. You have, of course, your quality system and your licensing, and of course, your post-market surveillance. So let me go through the different steps of developing a medical device. So here's kind of the five steps. Your first step, again, I come back to an unmet need. Remember I talked about that with drugs. You're not just gonna make a device that's a copy of something else with a little bit of a tweak. Ideally, you're going to create or innovate to find something that has really is is um, is meeting a, a shortcoming that other devices or other technologies have left wide open. This is called needs driven innovation. You have discussions with marketing, R&D, with regulatory, with your legal department and with your clinical people to look at, you know, what is really missing out there. You do a competitive analysis and look at the market. 
to look at that unmet need. And but in doing that, you also have to look at your market potential. If if your device or your technology is so niche that you're only going to end up selling three across Canada and 30 across the US, well, it doesn't make sense to actually develop that product because it costs a lot to develop. So is there a real market for it? Can you get a patent for it? And how can you develop it from a regulatory and clinical perspective? And then you have to also understand, are you going to be developing this for the global market or just the developed world? So there's the developed markets, there's the emerging markets. Are you uh, targeting the urban centers or rural centers, or maybe one over the other? So you have to, all your ideas and your, your um, you know, all the discussions around this potential new technology has to take all of these things into account. Then you look at uh, whether it's feasible. So what function does your product really need to deliver? You have to develop a prototype and figure out, does it work? And do your proof of concept. Same thing like a drug. You have to do that proof of concept. Do, does it do what you think it's supposed to do? Ideally, at this point, you would get customer input. input. So let's say you're developing something for the hospital, for a, a surgical market. Hopefully, you have some KOLs you can talk to, to, to to ask. You have a surgeon and say, okay, this is what I'm developing. Would this meet your needs? And so often they'll say, well, you know, ideally, I would love it if you could do it this way. And then you'll go back to your R&D team and say, well, can we tweak it to make it work this way? You're going to plan your project and your timeline. You're going to start what's called a design history file. For any technology, all your notes, all your drawings, you have to keep them somewhere safe and start a file to show the development of that technology. Because that design history file will actually um, be very useful when you look at the risk of that technology to see, okay, if I tweak uh, a particular section of my technology, does that increase risk or decrease risk? And sometimes you need to go back to your old notes and try and figure out, well, why did I do it that way? And then you realize, oh, it's because I wanted to manage the risk here. But if you manage the risk here, sometimes you create risk elsewhere. So keeping those notes, keeping all that information, those drawings, and building upon that file as you go through these steps to product launch is really, really important. You have to do some preclinical trials and then figure out um, with your product design team and your system engineers how it really does function. Does it really work? Then you have to figure out your budget. And you also have to be talking to your marketing people on your potential revenue because your research, your, your return on investment is really important at this stage is, is, remember I said, if it's a very niche product, you may not make back the money that you've uh, invested in developing this. And you have to figure out what class of risk it is, how you're gonna get it approved by Health Canada, and also who is going to be paying for that device. I'll talk about, about that a little bit more later. You have to verify and validate your design. You have to make sure that you have that complete working prototype and that you could validate that prototype, continue evaluating your regulatory pathway, develop your clinical trials, uh, define your quality management system. How are you gonna make sure that you manufacture it the same way every time, that you have controls over your manufacturing and that you're able to control also your documentation. And then you should be looking at filing your patent. You could file it a little bit before, you could file it a little bit after, you have to be talking to your legal team to make sure you understand at what point you file your patent. I put a little link there to the patent, um, the Canadian patent site, if you're curious to look at different patents. Your engineers are very, um, are involved here at this stage, your regulatory, clinical, and your legal. At this stage, which is final validation, product launch, you have to define your intended use, because your label has to say exactly what you plan on using it for, because that's what Health Canada is going to look at. And they're going to compare your intended use to the studies that you will be presenting. Your clinical studies for in vitro diagnostic devices, there's something called CLSI studies. 
there's biocompatibility studies, there's electrical technical studies, there's a whole bunch of different studies. And Health Canada, and I'll show you some slides after five time, actually has a really nice um, listing of all the different things that you should think of when developing certain types of drugs. You also want to look at scaling up your installations, your operations, your performance. You have to qualify all these things to make sure that those prototypes, those working prototypes can be scaled up and manufactured for product launch. You want to decide if you want to brand the product, the, uh, a, product a product name. You want to figure out where you're going to launch it. You want to make sure that your risk management is uh, up to date, is understood by everybody in the company. And I'll talk about that in a second. And then you want to submit to Health Canada and decide who's going to uh, pay for it. You launch your product, you have to train your physician, you have to train your reps, you have to make sure that you, uh, you have post-market surveillance if there's any adverse events on the market. When it's out there, you have to capture those. You have to manage your risk. You have to maintain your design. So maybe there are, is tweaking to be done when you, it gets out there in, in wide use and you get complaints back. Those complaints are very useful because they allow you to go back to your engineers and say, I, this is the fourth complaint I'm getting that, you know, this knob is sticking. So they have to go back and say, ooh, there's a, maybe a, a little bit of a design issue that we have to tweak, you know, update it, and you fix it. From concept to market, a medical device takes about three to seven years, which is much, much shorter than drugs. This, I'm not going to go through this. This is basically a laundry list of all the things that Health Canada wants to see in a submission for a medical device. Depending on the risk class, they will ask for different things. And there are guidances that tell you what studies you have to present from safety and effectiveness perspective, from the manufacturing perspective, packaging, your shelf life, and your risk assessment. There are guidances available from Health Canada on the development of in vitro diagnostic devices, on HIV, on software, because software is a medical device, on cybersecurity, if you do have software or you have any software within your technology, um, on dermal fillers, on custom made devices, ultrasounds. There's some, uh, you know, all these different very specific guidances on these products and then the general guidances for the rest. They give you lists of recognized standards. So these are uh, standards for the different types of technologies you might be developing and they are uh, providing you the international standards. So the ISO, IEC, CSA or ASTM, these are international standards for how you are supposed to test your product to make sure that it works and that it's safe for the different types of, uh, of groups of, of technologies. So all of that is in, um, is in the guidances for Health Canada. Quality management system is ISO 13485 for uh, medical devices. It allows you as a company to control your suppliers, to control your documentation, to control your building and equipment, your product design, your development, your risk, and to measure your improvement. So your complaints and your adverse events, your auditing, all of that needs to be understood and developed before you put your product on the market. And what does risk management mean? Um, sometimes uh, engineers understand what a failure modes and effects analysis is. It's basically looking at your technology and identifying possible failures in design. Well, under uh, the medical devices regulations or, or under ISO 1345, we uh, have to manage risk of a device as per ISO 14971, which is really applying risk management, not just to failure, but to all of your procedures and your practices. And looking at how you analyze, evaluate, control, and monitor your risk. So it's not just the technology, but it's your systems, your documentation, your um, uh, risk to patients, how you're collecting the information back from patients and or uh, the end user. 
So it's not just the technology and the failures, but it's really a systematic approach to managing risk of your entire company and your technology. Who pays for the marketed device? This is a busy slide and I apologize. Um, here's the link where it's from, but it's basically, it's, 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 it's different from a drug. There's no formal health technology assessment done that's pan-Canadian. Each province, and here I put Ontario and Quebec, each province has their own ways to look at devices. And sometimes they leave it up to the individual hospital budgets. So let's say a surgeon goes to a, a, um, a Canadian conference and finds a new gizmo that they want to try. They will often go back to the hospital and go back to the budgetary committee and say, I want to buy this gizmo. And the hospital will say, well, how much is it? And based on the budget, they will decide yes or no. Sometimes there are specialty programs. Um, if it's something to be used for cancer patients, there might be a specific cancer uh, budget within a hospital or even within a provincial uh, uh, program that might decide to pay for a particular new technology. Private payers, so those are your, those are your insurance companies. So your private insurance companies, they may be the ones in the end who pay for the device if it's not uh, covered by the public uh, system, uh, or if it's not paid by private payers either, it might be you, the consumer. So for example, my company has a new blood test. The blood test is available in labs, but the government hasn't paid for it yet. They haven't, it's been five, it's been on the market for five years. They, um, the government hasn't looked at it yet to decide whether or not to pay for it. So consumers have to pay for it or uh, their private insurance has to pay for it. Okay, um, how much time do we have? So I don't know if we want, these are just some some fun slides. I don't know if we want to, maybe I'll just go to, just to say that um, just very quickly is basically there's the new innovation is looking a lot on uh, the elderly population on data analytics. There's demand for devices with new technology information and technology. I don't know if any of you, it's another Star Trek reference. I don't know if any of you knows what this is. It's actually a tricorder. And what this was is you used to wave it over a patient and on the bottom here it used to tell you, you used to scan the patient and tell you exactly what was wrong with it. Well, um, a few years ago, there was a contest out there for uh, device companies to come up with a tricorder and a company actually did. Doesn't look like the Star Trek tricorder, but it is a product that has a number of sensors. And based on the artificial intelligence program that is programmed within this device, it can accurately diagnose up to 34 different medical conditions, anemia, diabetes, diabetes, COPD, pneumonia, etc. So interesting how technology is trying to mimic, um, you know, the, the sci-fi. Uh, but some of those ideas were pretty darn cool. And uh, software and apps are other things that are being developed. Uh, you know, most of you probably have Apple Watches, and these things can tell you whether you know you you, you have an irregular heart rhythm. And remember, I said software was a medical device. Well, the software that is involved in that notification for irregular heartbeat, well, that software is. Uh, has to be approved by Health Canada as a medical device. So apps, um, this ECG app, that has to be approved by Health Canada and reviewed. Those are medical devices. Okay, just to leave you with two more minutes, the business of science. I told you in the beginning, I was a total science nerd and, and business scared the heck out of me. In the end, I've become a business person. I, um, uh, I really love business and based on my experience in entrepreneurial companies, I can now take a look at a, a, a drug or a technology and understand whether that technology meets an unmet need, whether it makes sense. You have to understand whether you're who your target audience is and, and how to reach them. Who is your customer? What is your customer need? And is my product going to fulfill that need? Those are all questions I ask myself whenever there's a new product, new technology. 
What are the benefits of my product? How am I filling that need? Is there a market for that product? Sometimes we make mistakes and we think we put something on the market and we think it's going to sell and it doesn't. Because we've underestimated how big the market is. We've underestimated the competition. We've underestimated actually that that product, that the customer will actually say, yes, I really do need that product. So there's a lot of homework that you have to do before you really put a product on the market. You have to know who the competition is. Sometimes that competition is fierce and they will talk badly about your product to your customers. It's not professional, but it's done all the time. And how do you position your product? What is that unique selling point? How do you convince the influential leaders to support your product, so your doctors, your hospitals? How are you identifying who your partners are to help you market and distribute your product? You as a small company, if you're a small technology company and you're four scientists and, and maybe one business person, maybe you need to partner up with somebody to help you, you know, target those markets that you want to penetrate or to even you know, distribute. Are you going to use FedEx? Or are you going to use UPS? Or are you going to use a third party logistics provider to get your product out there into the market? You need your strategies for promotion, so your marketing. You need educational tools to train the people how to use it, whether those are online tools or the promo pieces. You need to understand your product, your technology to create those tools to help people understand how to use it. The, you don't want to frustrate people, you know, once they have your technology and not try and figure out, you know, if they can't figure out how to use it, well, then you've lost pretty much a customer. You want them on your side. You need to know your resource allocation. You're now a new company. How, do you need new sales reps? Do you need marketing people? What's your budget? Uh, are you going to get your return on investment? You know, what are your expenses? Your, what are your expected profits? When do you think you're going to make up the money that you spent developing it? So all these things are the business part of science. But the scientist is always involved in these conversations. I put here exit strategies because a lot of you are maybe going to launch small biotech or technology companies. And at different stages of development, you may decide to exit. And what I mean by that is you may decide to sell your company or your technology to a bigger gun who will then take that product and bring it to a larger audience. But you have to be careful because you don't want to exit too soon because the idea, of course, is you know, to try to make back the money that you spent or make a little bit of extra money. So you have to uh, make sure you get some really good uh, mentoring on you know, the business side to know at what, what point you really could or should exit your venture if you want to exit. Of course, you can not exit and, and, and continue and market the product. Okay, you have to remember, uh, you have to understand how to register, how to protect your product with your patents, and how as a scientist you can help bring your business to your company goals. Take home messages, your undergraduate or your graduate degree is your starting point. Do what interests you. Even if you think business doesn't interest you, maybe it will later on. Learn, keep your eyes and ears open, uh, no matter what position you end up being in. Um, listen in those in those you know cross-functional team meetings. Just listen because you you pick up stuff that you never knew you would you know actually internalize and then use later on in life. Don't be afraid of business. Bring yourself out of your comfort zone. Um, Find a mentor in, you know, maybe something that's outside of, of what you're comfortable with so that you can learn. Use your contacts. This is super important. When I mentor students, I always say, if you know people in a company where you might want to get a position or in a position that interests you, well, call them and speak to them about it. Well, they may know somebody who has a job who you know, it might just happen that, that they'll think of you next time there's a job opening. You know, and bug them, email them, follow up with them. The drug and medical device industry is always growing and innovating, but do your homework. When you're going to an interview, do your homework on the company and even the person. You know, most grown-ups that you're going to meet uh, don't understand privacy settings for 
Facebook or any social media. So go and stalk them on those social medias because you might learn a little bit about the person that you're meeting. You don't have to tell them you've stalked them, of course, but it gives you a little bit of an edge to understand, let's say they're a big golfer, um, you know, to, to bring something into your uh, interview that has to do with golf. I don't know, it's, it's, it's trying to find a connection point with the person that you are meeting, um, it just, it allows you to uh, become more comfortable and make the interaction a little bit more personal. I'm gonna leave you with this, this is my very last slide. Again, from Dr. Osler, the very first step towards success in any occupation is to become interested in it. If you are not interested in what you do, if you are bored, you will not have the motivation and you will not want to continue. So if you do get bored, there's no harm in switching and learning something new, getting out of your comfort zone and trying something new as well. Thank you. So let me know if there's questions. Excellent, thank you so much, Katya. I see some virtual applause and I definitely encourage that. I hope everyone's applauding. Uh, in their mind or in private, uh, and I see more popping up as well. <laughs> so, so yeah, just imagine a roaring cloud of, uh, crowd of applause because that, that's what you deserve. I appreciate uh, an excellent talk from you. I um, also appreciate the, the anecdotes and historical context. Uh, they were very, very well received. Um, so let's open it up to Q&A now, please. Um, please don't be shy to post in the chat or you can raise your hand or just even jump in by unmuting yourself. Um, please, anyone with, with your questions. If, if we don't have any questions, uh, could I jump in? Is that okay? Absolutely. Okay. Um, I was just curious to know um, in your experience, if you can provide an example of a gray zone between a medical device versus uh, a drug and, and what you've encountered during your career. Okay. That's a really good question. First of all, there are products that are called drug device combinations. So sometimes you have a medical device that includes a drug in it as well. But um, I actually have a very recent, uh, recent example of, it's not really a gray zone, but it's, it's in a way something that the client, one of my clients didn't know, is they, have a, they had a cosmetic and um, the function of the cosmetic was sort of to reduce skin irritation. And um, one of the competitors has all kinds of claims on their product. And it's like, why do they have their claims? Cosmetics, you can't have claims on it. You can't have drug claims on a cosmetic. It turns out that the other product was actually functioning as a medical device. It was functioning as a barrier and, and that is a medical device. When you're a barrier, you're not acting by a chemical mean, but really as a barrier mean, that is a chemical, that is a, a medical device. And therefore they were allowed to have those claims. So there are some, sometimes you have to understand where your product fits and what the claims are that you want to make, but you have to understand how the product works and how it behaves and how it does what it's supposed to do. And that's a, an example. Thank you. I had a question as well. I, I actually had the similar question as Morgan, um, but I guess I, um, I'm wondering in terms of the future, do you think that pharma and med tech are going to become more and more intertwined? Like, is that gray zone going to expand? I think it's going to expand a lot. And, and, and that to me is really because of, and, and I, I guess I went through it too quickly. The one slide I had was there was a, a, a product that was a, um, an inhaler. And the way that the company uh, or the, the doctor is, is measuring the compliance to that inhaler is actually with an app. That app is linked to the inhaler pump itself. And it knows how many pumps and how many times a day that patient is taking their drug. That app then sends that information to the physician. And if there's a compliance issue, the physician can then call the patient and say, listen, you, you know, you missed your dose or how come you're missing every third dose, that kind of thing. So that uh, is actually a very, very real and recent intersection between 
medical devices and technology and drugs. That's actually being used today in very, very, um, very well, actually. Okay, I, have a question. I have a question. Hello, that was a really nice talk. Uh, I'm a like, first year PhD at McGill. So my concern is the project I'm working on. This is not something like I can tell somebody that I'm going to cure a disease or I'm going to make a drug. It's a very basic research. So uh, I'm always concerned with this thing, like at the end of it, what should I do? Like uh, if I go to a company, what, what should I tell them? Like what have I done or why would they take me for this job? Okay. It's actually a great question because whenever somebody asked me, so what did you do in your PhD? I would always say, oh, never mind, it's not going to cure anything. It's, it was basic research, complete basic research. But what you learn in your PhD, the process, and you'll see, you're, if you're in first year, just as you go along, you, you learn how to write, you learn how to present, you learn how to critically assess articles, all of that skill set is what you present to a company. It doesn't matter what therapeutic area. So unless you want to go for an MSL job, an MSL usually looks at whether you did your PhD in a particular uh, therapeutic area that they're, that they're interested in because they, they might want an, an expert in immunology, for example. But other than an MSL job, it's the skill set that you're getting doing your PhD. You know, you're, you're sitting there and you have to, you, you have to solve problems on your own. You have, to, you have to go and, you know, maybe talk to peers and, and ask them for input so that you can solve your problem. So there's teamwork. There's all kinds of skills that you're getting that have nothing to do with, you know, the receptor you might be looking at. So I wouldn't worry there at all. Okay, thanks. And what is kind of the pipeline to go from, like, a grad student to become, a, like, a someone researching in the clinical area, like a real world thing, like how do I go from working in a lab to work with something really important in the real world? So you would, so I would look at clinical research jobs as your first okay. job. So the, that's called a clinical research associate. That's the first step in, a, in the clinical research uh, division of a company. And what you do as that job is you uh, go to the sites, the hospital sites, and you make sure that the clinical studies are being done according to the protocol. So you're looking at the data that's being entered by the nurse, you're looking at the patient files, and you're making sure that everything is done properly. That's the first stage. As you move up in the clinical research world, you move up to writing protocols, uh, doing, uh, writing the reports, so there's a, a whole, uh, you know, a whole kind of ladder up the, the clinical research world. But that's a, a really interesting, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, career path, clinical research. So even if I'm not doing something right now that's related to a clinical research? No, okay. not at all. It's, again, it's the skill set you are learning during PhD and not what you're learning. I always say that. It doesn't matter what your PhD thesis is on. It's, it's the skill set you're learning and you're, you're, you're getting throughout that process. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. Jesse, can you read out the chats? Because I saw something popped up. Sure, will do. We just have one audience member with their hand raised first. So I think let's yep. go to them first. Joshua, please. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, I hear you. OK. Um, uh, thank, first of all, thank you for your presentation. It's just like really thorough and detailed. I appreciate that. And I'm sure everyone else does. Uh, I just wanted to ask a question concerning patents because um, you mentioned like, um, you, you briefly mentioned like, oh, the company applies for patents in free clinicals. So I was thinking of something. What, how, how do you deal with a situation where, um, because patents are territorial, because like if you're in Quebec, if you're in Montreal, you're going to apply for a patent here in Canada. So like, what if like, uh, there's some nefarious actors like in overseas markets, how do you deal with like them, like not just like applying for patents for stuff that you work on in their markets immediately? Yeah. How do you yeah. protect your patent? You, you have to get legal advice because you should be um, submitting a patent, a worldwide patent. So there is a way to do that. I'm not a legal expert, but I know that you can do 
patent in different countries or a worldwide patent in order for you to protect your technology. So that's why you have to be careful not to publish too much about your technology where somebody could then submit a patent and, uh, you know, and, and, and stop you from actually submitting a worldwide patent in another country. So it's real. That's why, you know, in that, that those five um, steps, legal is at the very beginning. You really should be talking to legal at the very, very beginning of your innovative idea, just to get a, a roadmap on what you should be doing for patent and how you can protect your patent. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, I'll start reading some questions in the chat here. So first, what do physicians like to hear when a new drug is brought to their attention by a pharmaceutical sales rep or scientist? What do they like to hear? Um, I think they want to understand why, you know, the benefits of the drug and the risks of the drug. So, um, you know, it's really hard if the drug that you have is not, is not really innovative and it's just kind of a, a, what we call a me too drug. So another, uh, you know, cholesterol lowering drug. But let's say it is an, another cholesterol lowering drug. Well, what is the benefit of yours over what's already on the market? So you really have to sell, you know, your product and the why yours is so much better than what they're already using. Sometimes you're selling it on the effectiveness. So it, yours works much better, but sometimes you're selling it uniquely on the fact that it doesn't provide the same adverse events as another product. And I have an example, actually. So my old boss, so the marketing guy, he had a, a product uh, um, that he was responsible for. And the way that he marketed it was that it did not, did not cause diarrhea for a particular condition that the current drug was causing. And it was causing it in every person. So people were becoming less compliant on the drug because of the diarrhea that it caused. His drug didn't cause diarrhea, but it wasn't, it was a me too drug. So it wasn't thrilling and exciting, but it didn't cause that diarrhea. When he marketed it to the doctors that way, through the sales reps, he was able to take over the market share for that product because of that benefit. So sometimes it's a, it's a little thing. Sometimes you have to be creative, um, but you really have to know your drug to be able to sell it properly. Excellent, thank you. Next question here is, is it really important to have internship experience before finishing a PhD degree? Um, and is it important to have good papers to get a job in the pharma or medtech industries? Uh, good questions. Um, internship, would you do it during your PhD? Sorry, Jesse, I didn't, uh, maybe it's, uh, I didn't understand that. So the question was, during... was, yes, before finishing the PhD. So yes, I would say. So, um, you know what, again, I think it, it all depends on, on you and what you've done in, you know, in your PhD. An internship helps in the sense that you're gathering skills that you may not already have. Um, I know that there's a post PhD internship that McGill has with the pharma industry. And I've actually had a couple of interns come through that program. So it's, it's once they finish their PhD, um, there's an internship for three months that uh, McGill will help support in a pharma company and they will learn certain skills that they'll be exposed to a lot of different things. And that actually does help because one, it exposes you to all different things. And two, it might, you know, tell you that you might not like what you thought you might like. So, you know, it's a, it's a process where you might be able to learn things. So, yes, it's helpful. Is it necessary? No. Um, but it, it, you know, it might be helpful to, to help you learn what you might like to do. And what was the second part? Sorry. Publication. How important are papers? Oh, publications. Uh, I don't know for me as a recruiter, like if I was hiring somebody, not important at all. What's important to me is the person. I always interview the person and what they've done in their life and their personality and their willingness to learn, not being afraid of, you know, going out there and learning new things. That, that to me is more important than having, you know, three publications versus eight. I, that doesn't, you know, if you've gotten your PhD 
and McGill says you're okay or, or any other uh, university says you're okay, then you deserve that PhD. It doesn't matter. Perfect. I think uh, we have time for one more question before the one o'clock hour. I know you said, Katya, you could stick yeah, no around. no problem. Yeah, I can after, stay. But uh, let's, uh, let's ask this one more question. Um, for entry-level positions in regulatory affairs, what are the best skills or certification that graduate students should have? Okay. Uh, in my day, there was really nothing. I learned on the job. Today, there's a diploma in uh, at University of Montreal, and in Toronto, there's one at Humber College. It's a um, regulatory affairs diploma. You pretty much go through what I just did, but in greater detail by... Uh, you know, over an entire year. Um, is it really necessary? None of the positions that I've ever looked at require that. I think that it might uh, provide you maybe with the opportunity to get more interviews because some of these universities will have links to the companies. And so if there are entry level positions, you might, you know, they might be able to position you to, to you know, get an interview. But if you want to try after your PhD to go right into regulatory affairs, that's not a problem either. You know, you can do it after a master's and a bachelor's as well. Regulatory affairs has bachelor's, master's, and PhDs. Okay, great. Um, I think I'll say some closing words now before the one o'clock hour, just for those people who do need to leave, but we mm -hmm. can s keep the chat open. Sure. Um, Katya, thank you so much for your, for your excellent uh, seminar. I'm sure it was of great benefit and uh, insight to all. I also want to thank my collaborators at the Pharmaceutical Career Students Network at McGill. Thank you for setting this up. Um, please do note that uh, this, this talk will be posted on uh, the MedTech Talent Accelerator website. So you can visit ryerson.ca slash medtechtalent. Um, please follow us on social media, LinkedIn. I think uh, Pharmaceutical Career Student Network as well. You have social media outlets to keep people informed. Um, so please do follow that. Um, otherwise, thank you everyone for attending. We'll stay on for a bit longer with those who still have questions, but uh, a final round of applause. Thank you so much. You're welcome. My pleasure.